Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You need to let your will come into agreement with God's will. Give it a nice long vacation and remember that any time that you are resisting God and what he wants, you are going to be miserable until you decide to give in. Can I say that again? Anytime you're resisting God and refusing to do what you know he wants you to do, even if that's go and apologize to your husband or or your wife, guys. You know, it wouldn't hurt you to say occasionally, I was wrong. Yeah. Can we practice that, men? I was wrong. Oh, you didn't sound very excited about it. Every time Dave says I'm wrong, I try to record it. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, 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 uh. But honestly, you know, years ago, I'd get mad and stay mad so long, and I'd be miserable because I knew it wasn't what God wanted. I was not in agreement with God's will. My will needed to just go on vacation and let God have his way. I needed to enter the rest of God and stop trying to fight everything that God wanted me to do. And so, however long I would be stubborn, that's how long I'd be miserable. And I've learned that when God wants you to do something, you might as well give in as quick as you can. Because the longer you put it off, the unhappier you're going to be. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. I will ease, relieve, and refresh your soul. Your soul is your, your inner man, that hidden person of the heart. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. In other words, Jesus is saying, learn how I handle things. Watch me and do what you think I would do in that situation. I am gentle, meek, humble, lowly in heart. And you will find rest, relief, ease, recreation, and blessed quiet. I love those words in the Amplified Bible. Let's, let's look at them. Relief, ease, refreshment, and recreation. So... A few years ago, I kind of combined all those together and said, it sounds to me like God wants to give us an internal vacation. Because, you know, even if you're laying down resting your body, but your mind is on something, worried about it, you're not resting. If you're all upset about something, you're not resting. If you're resisting God's will in something, then you're not resting. And I've been teaching the Word of God 32 years. I've been a Christian a lot longer than that, but only a serious Christian about 32 years. And serious-minded Christians eventually learn what it means to have peace. I'm addicted to peace. I just can't stand to be all upset. I don't even want to be a little bit upset. My yoke is wholesome, useful, good, not harsh, hard, sharp, or pressing. It's comfortable, gracious, and pleasant. My burden is light and easy to be borne. So, Bottom line is, is God never gives us more than what we can handle. With every temptation, he also provides the way out. There's no point in saying, I can't do this, because if God has given it to you to do, then you can do it. There's no point in saying, I can't stand this, because the Bible says he never, never allows more to come on us than what we can bear. But with every temptation, he also provides the way out. So we can do whatever we need to do, and it's not the thing that we're dealing with that is so hard, really. It's the way we approach it. It's our attitude toward it. You know, as long as I kept trying to change my husband, there was no peace in my soul. Because there were, I always had thoughts about everything he did. Here he goes again. And you know... Some of you may be in situations that are very ungodly that you never should have gotten yourself in to start with. But by and large, irregardless of what we think, God does put us together with who and what we need 
They're normally very different than us. And somehow or another that turns out to be a big problem for everybody, but we really should see it as a benefit because that person has what you don't have, you have what they don't have, and then as the two become one flesh, they become a powerful unit. God had a call on my life, obviously, and I needed a very special man to be able to handle having a wife who does what I do. Dave has listened to me hundreds of thousands of hours from that front row over the years. He's a great man of God, put together in a special way by God to be able to allow me to do what God has called me to do. And I used to want to change him all the time. I, I wish you talked more. I wish you were more aggressive. I wish you this. I wish you that. One day he said, you better thank God that I am the way I am because if I wasn't, you sure wouldn't be doing what you're doing. <laughs> That's right, see. And so here I was. I was internally upset all the time, not being happy with what God gave me when in reality what he gave me was exactly what I needed. And so it was just my way of looking at it that was a problem. Would some of you be willing to go back to some of the same situations you have and instead of stressing yourself out trying to change the situation, would you be willing to change your attitude? Is there somebody here today that would be willing to change your attitude towards some of your situations and say, you know what, God? Maybe this is better for me than I think it is. And maybe there's something here that I just don't see and haven't been willing to see. But I'm not going to fight against you anymore. If this really needs to change, then you're the only one that can change it. And instead of me trying to change everybody else, I just want to cooperate with you and let you change me. Now that's when we have peace. That is when we have peace. Today I want to talk to you about giving God your all. So maybe I should start out by saying, is there some area in your life where you're still wrestling with God, holding out, not being submissive to what He's saying to you, trying to find a different way other than the way that God has told you to do it? I can promise you if that's the case that you will stay miserable until you decide to get into agreement with God. Are you dating Jesus or married to him? It's kind of interesting. You know, Dave and I dated for a while. Not too long. He couldn't, God couldn't let it go too long because Dave might have found out what it was like and wouldn't have married me. But <laughs> We had a rather quick courtship. We had five dates and got married. But when we were dating, I still had my own will, my own freedom. I could still do what I wanted to, come and go as I pleased, spend what I wanted to. But when we got married, a lot of things changed. Number one, when Dave and I got married, I got his name. Now, when I got his name, that meant that I got everything that came along with his name. He had a car in his name. I didn't have a car when we got married, but now all of a sudden I had a car. <laughs> I didn't have any money when we got married, but Dave had a little money, and now all of a sudden I had money too. <laughs> I had help. When I couldn't get the lid off the mayonnaise jar, I could hand it to him, and he could get it right off. <laughs> when something was too heavy for me to pick up, he was right there to help me carry it. But there's another side to the story, and the other side is, is I no longer could do everything I wanted to do every time I wanted to do it, the way I wanted to do it, when I wanted to do it, because now there was somebody else in my life. <laughs> See, some of you don't have any idea what you're doing when you get married. <laughs> you think it's all about the way the guy looks and the way he makes you feel when he kisses you. And you have to be very, very careful that you don't just get married on emotion because there's a lot of things that are going to have to change. But there's a big difference in dating and marriage. And I think a lot of people are just kind of dating Jesus. 
when you get married, then your will can no longer be your own. You have somebody else you're responsible for, but you get his name. The name above every name. That at the mention of that name, every knee must bow. You see, when I was dating Dave, I couldn't go sign his name on something. If you're just kind of fooling around in your Christian walk and you only want God for emergencies and, you know, you like a little date here and there, but mainly you want to run your own life and do your own thing and behave however you want to behave, then you can forget calling on that name and having the power of heaven released in your behalf when you pray. You only get the name when you get married. We need to get an understanding that we don't belong to ourselves. We have been bought with a price, purchased, and made his own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, You are no longer your own. You have been bought with a price, purchased with a preciousness. We don't belong to ourselves, and we have no right to continue running our own lives. Now, John 17, 10. I love this scripture. It's so powerful. It says, Jesus said to the Father, all that is mine is yours and all that is yours is mine. You see that all things that are mine are yours and all things that are yours belong to me. My goodness, can we say that to God today? Can we get in on that great exchange? Can we lift up our faces to heaven and say, God, all things that are mine are yours. And then he says back, and all things that are mine are yours. I call it the great exchange. I can give him my sin, he'll give me his righteousness. I can give him my broken, wounded life and he will give me beauty. I can give him my hopelessness, he'll give me his hope. I can give him all my turmoil, and all my old ways of doing things and he'll give me a new nature, he'll give me peace. I can give him my sadness, he'll give me joy. But you see, I really can't just pick and choose and take the good parts and say, well, I want to have joy, but I don't want to be obedient. I want to have peace, but I'd also like to be stubborn. I think it's right and proper for me to talk to you today about giving your will a vacation. I'm tired of fighting things. I'm tired of resisting things. I'm tired of trying to make everything in the world be the way I want it to be and make all the people in my life be the way I want them to be. I'm going to agree with God and give my will a vacation. Oh, and it just feels so good. Let's remember what Jesus said in the garden knowing what he was about to have to face. So much pressure on him, he sweated great drops of blood. Father, if possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, your will be done and not mine. At that point, there had to be total, complete rest. Although he was facing the most difficult thing that any human being could ever imagine, the moment that he released his will to God, angels came to strengthen him and enable him. If you will give your will to God, especially if you know of certain situations where you're really fighting God. You know, it's one thing to just arbitrarily say, well, God, I, I give my all to you today. We can all do that. We all know how to sing, I surrender all. But how foolish is it to lift up our hands and Look at the words on the overhead projector and sing, I surrender all, and then go home. And if somebody hurts your feelings, instead of believing the best, like the Bible says, you get mad and pout all day and have a pity party. That's not surrendering anything, <laughs> let alone all. But if we could just simply say today, God, I don't like this. I wish you could take this cup from me. But if not, your will be done. I'm not going to fight it anymore. You know, our misery comes in fighting things that we can't do anything about. Hey, if you can do something about it, do it. If you can't, then give it to God. And if he can't do anything about it, then 
It certainly don't need to be done. Everything that's mine is yours, and everything that's yours is mine. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. The Apostle Paul said, I beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies. Now watch this. Presenting all your members and faculties. Everybody say all. <laughs> As a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, devoted, consecrated. You know, there's words in the Bible that we don't use anymore. There's words in the Bible that were big words when the church was being birthed that we don't even really pay that much attention to anymore. Dedicated, consecrated, holy. We are to be dedicated to God consecrated to God. You know what that means? We are set apart for a special purpose and a special use. You know, I don't, when we need topsoil to fix up our garden in the spring, I don't hand the guy that helps us with the yard all my purses and tell him to go fill them full of topsoil and bring it in. That's not what they're for. I use them for something else. This is my water glass that I use on the road. It only keeps Joyce's water. The crew does not drink their coffee out of it or their soda pops. It's for my water. It's been set aside and dedicated for my water. Well, we as God's children are to be dedicated for a special purpose. That means you don't get to do what everybody else in the world gets to do. But it also means that you have privileges that they don't have. You can have peace in the midst of the harm, storm. You can have joy when there's no reason to be happy. You can have supernatural favor on you. So when you go to a look for a job, you can get a job you're not even qualified for. God can do amazing things for you. I think we should live with our mouth hanging open and all. That was God. But it's all dependent on, I beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of all, all. That means your mind, your emotions, your will, your eyes, your hands, your feet, your money, your gifts, your talents, your abilities. Dedicate it all to God and then just see what God does. All you need to do is just sincerely say, I give it to you. I think we should, every morning we should say, God, what can I do for you today? We don't need to give God our 15-point list of everything he needs to do for us today to keep us saved. Well, God, if you don't do this, I don't think I can stand it. If, if, you know, I just don't think I can wait on this anymore, God. I just feel like I'm going to cave in if you don't do this. God knows what you want. The Bible says he knows what we want before we ever ask him. That doesn't mean we shouldn't ask, but we don't need to camp on top of it and just over and over. You know, we need to say, God, you know what I want. Your word says that if I will delight myself in you, you will give me the desires of my heart. <laughs> delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And then Psalm 37 goes on to say, commit your way unto him. And he will bring it to pass. That was a scripture that my mother-in-law wrote in the front of my very first Bible that she gave me 42 years ago as a wedding gift. Commit your way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he will bring it to pass. Well, honey, I had no idea what that journey was going to be like. <laughs> my gosh, was I stubborn. Woo, I was strong-willed. We need to commit all of, our, all of ourselves to God. You know, Genesis 6, 22 says, Noah did according to all that God commanded him. You know what? I don't imagine that was easy. How much obedience do we really walk in? Especially if what God asks us to do makes no sense to our minds. That can't be God. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Whatever makes you think that everything God asks you to do is going to make any sense. I don't imagine it made much sense when, they told, when he told Joshua 
to take the group of people and march around Jericho seven times blowing trumpets and then to shout. I don't imagine it made much sense to Moses when he said, go put your rod in the Red Sea and I'll part it. Noah, build an ark. We're going to have a flood. He didn't even know what rain was. I can't even imagine how people laughed at him and how much they made fun of him and how hard it had to be for him. But Noah did according to all that God commanded him. And then when the flood came, only Noah and his family were saved. Come on, no matter what's going on in the world, God will protect us if we are obedient to do what he asks us to do. Paul said that if he would have been trying to be popular with people, he wouldn't have been an apostle. And I can tell you, if you're going to go all the way with God, it's probably going to mess with your reputation. If you're going to go all the way with God, you may lose some of your more mediocre Christian friends. Because it's amazing how many people want to date Jesus, but they're not interested in the full deal meal. You know, just because everybody today in the world likes to live together without the commitment, that doesn't mean that that's God's way. <laughs> Amen. We got to get fully committed. The word dedicate means devoted to. The Bible says we're called to be saints and designated for a consecrated life. Now, no matter what you've done in the past, this is the good news I have for you today. Maybe you've been doing it all wrong. Maybe you have been the most stubborn person in Florida. <laughs> Maybe if there was a contest today for the most stubborn human being, you could win hands down. But here's the good news. You can change today. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing I want you to get a hold of. It's not too late. God will put all your sins behind his back. Remove them as far as the east is from the west and remember them no more. You've got to make a decision. Paul said, I beg of you to make a decisive dedication. You can't dedicate yourself to God without a decision. And it has to be a quality decision, not an emotional decision. We can all go on a diet Sunday night after dinner. <laughs> it's Monday at noon. When the person we're at lunch with has dessert <laughs> that we know whether we've made a quality decision or not. But you can change today. And if you decide you're going to change, there's no devil in hell and no person on earth that can keep you from making progress. Do you hear me? Because when you decide to do things God's way, God hooks up with you. You are yoked together and you can live in this world and be victorious. And the whole time you're doing it, your soul can be on vacation. I mean, you can be in the most difficult marriage. Phew. Just go ahead and wear yourself out. I've decided I'm sticking this out. When you decide to get happy, I'll be here. Some people say, oh, I got to get another job. I'm the only Christian in my company. <laughs> Don't you dare leave a job that's full of lost people if you're the only light in the building. Don't you dare selfishly leave them in the dark. You say, well, this is so hard for me. I'm so upset. Well, go on vacation. I hope you never forget my little scene here. Maybe some of you ought to build yourself a little... You know? And the next time your kids are just driving you crazy, you just go sit down. Mom, 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 mom.
God wants us to keep Him first in all things. And if we don't, to be honest with you, nothing else really works right in our life. There's such a great scripture in Mark 12. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, all your soul, and out of and with all your mind, and with all of your strength. This is the first and the principal commandment. It's so important that we do that. And to be honest, our lives can get so busy and so full of so many things that it's very easy to suddenly, without even realizing we're doing it, let God begin to drift to the background of our lives. We always want to keep Him first in everything. First in your time, first in your finances, first in your decisions, first in everything that you do.